All right, Bay Bang, welcome to the Dave Portnoy Show with Eddie and Company, episode 19, presented by Taser. Dave, you love Taser. <laughs> yeah. Glass falling off. Uh, Taser strike light, rechargeable, high powered flashlight. They're going to repel an attacker through his electric stun feature. I may need it since I'm taking on the establishment. It literally combines a flashlight, stun gun. Why would you have a flashlight without this feature? Um, the Taser Pulse is the same personal device used by law enforcement. It shoots out two darts. Shoot him right in the neck, Eddie. Delivers electricity. Incapacitates someone for 30 seconds of time. Go to taser.com. Use promo code BARSTOOL. 15% off. Limited number of states require a permit for use. Taser products cannot be purchased for persons in Hawaii or Rhode Island. Yeah, you want to protect yourself safely, everybody. There's no better way to do that than Taser. Make sure you go check them out, taser.com, promo code Barstool, 15% off. All right, so obviously a lot of shit's going on. You're in the news for the Robin Hood fiasco, we'll call it. Uh, so we brought in a guy. We brought in um, fuck. Mark, Hope, Mark Cohitis. Mark Cohitis, yes. We brought in Mark Cohitis. Interesting guy. Yeah, so we're going to lead with that. I uh, had a good conversation with him. And then we're going to do a little more Robin Hood. Then we'll get into the usual stuff. So, yeah, let's just let it rip. Here's Marco Hydas. All right, so to kick off the show, we're joined by Marco Hodis. Dave, I, you you reached out to Mark last night, so thanks for doing this on short notice. Mark, how would you explain what you do, who you are, and everything like and, that? And even before you get that, I got – so Mark, I think, tweeted at me, and I got a bunch of people being like, take him seriously. He knows what he's talking about. And then we started DMing a little bit, and yesterday – I got a, he, he sent me a podcast, a different one he was on. And I watched the first five minutes. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And stop because I didn't want to, I didn't want to get too much information take away from me learning in real time. So that's how this got. And, and so now we can go with your question. Okay, perfect. So who are you? <laughs> I researched it. I read articles, but so I have a, a basic understanding, but how would you describe yourself? So I'm a 60 year old man who stopped running a hedge fund in the year 2009. And people know me as being a short seller. I have plenty of longs and I enjoy being long stocks, but I break the world down into three types of short sellers. There's people like me who are essentially extinct and going extinct, who look and go after bad guys, frauds, criminals, people ripping folks off, people who are horrible members of society, money launderers, uh, people who sell fake pharmaceuticals, rip off vets, subprime lending. So like it, 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 when I read this part, I, I, in my head, it was almost like a private investigator of the internet is how, is how the, I gauge it almost like you're snooping around trying to find when there's, there's shell companies or fake companies running around the internet or the stock market. Right. Well, Essentially that, but there's one thing that sort of drives me and it's not money. Are you? Beg your pardon? So many, no, go ahead. I, I have so many questions. I can't stand when people rip off working class folks of their hard earned money. Whether that's stock scams, get rich quick schemes, uh, selling people fentanyl, anything to make a fast buck to rip off Joe six pack staggers me. I can't stand it. And it's been my life's work really since 82 to expose people. I've put people in prison. Uh, the government's probably recovered a billion dollars plus in fines. You know, I've just sent a letter to my lawyer, sent a letter to the Senate and Congress that I'd like to testify in the upcoming hearings about the GameStop, Robin Hood, et cetera, because this has been my life's work and others my friend's life work to expose horrifically bad people. That's what I do. That's what I did. And, and I believe in it wholeheartedly. But what I do is dying and it's dying quickly because the market is strong. People don't want me to exist. I exposed a criminal a couple of years ago, Parker Petit, who ran a company called My Medics. He bribed a Senator, Johnny Isaacson, who sent two FBI agents by my house, scared the living shit out of my disabled son and told me to quit tweeting. I told him, do you have a warrant? No. Am I under investigation? No. I said, then get the fuck off my property. And they said, no. And it's been written about, I'm now suing the FBI to get the FOIA information on exactly how it went down. 
But that's the kind of bullshit and the threats that I've lived with in doing this kind of stuff. What's that movie with uh, Will Smith where he's just running around uh, with Gene Hackman running around from? It's not not Men in Black, is it? Men no, in no, no, Black. No, no. What kind of answer is that? Can someone look that? Anyways, he's run from the government. That I feel like we're talking to that. So one thing I noticed that in your mind, and I heard you say it on that podcast you were on, that the hedge fund guys and the short sellers of who you, the early part, because I feel like the definition has changed on what that is now. You said those aren't the guys who own the sports teams. Though, so now guys, guys like me do not own sports teams where, where, where the anger and the hostility and where the investigation should go and you're dead right is at the Stevie Collins, at his spawn, at the people who've spun out from there at the citadels these are the people who rigged the game against your fans and joe six-pack and the people who need a sporting chance so why do so the confusion then and this is top level which will get down which i think you're you're giving a very uh separate definition of i guess the same word like a short seller right now has a very negative connotation the way you described it i would say has a positive connotation you almost described what you were doing as a watchdog for the people where right now when you say short seller you're thinking melvin and you're thinking robert griffin and you're thinking people are screwing people well well where where it comes down to it is i do forensically significant work I put people or try to put people in jail to the extent that goes. I expose money launderers and criminals and people in kitty porn and stuff like that where guys shouldn't be around. That's one class of individual. Then there's the bloggers or the activists, if you will, guys like Andrew Left. And I've known Left for 20 some odd years and he's a good guy, but he tries to make money moving stocks around with stuff. And, and his whole class, I call them the smash and grab bunch. And they probably shouldn't be around anymore because they upset people. They move stocks in the very short term. They scare people out. And then when the stocks fly, there's built-in anger for the shorts. The crowd that needs to be where everyone needs to focus on are the hedge funds who use excessive leverage. And they use excessive leverage to get outsized returns, the two and 20 bunch who make billions, billions and billions. These are the suits and they use shorts to hedge off their long book and they're lazy and they're not good at it. And they got caught in this GME fiasco and some of these other things and they've inflicted huge collateral damage on the people like myself if they're in business who do the real work. So when you say, when someone says they're a ball player, well, there's anyone from Reggie Jackson all the way down to Mario Mendoza. And, and I, for what I do, I am hated. I am constantly have threats on my life and my kid's life and my wife's life, et cetera. I am hated. And I sat next to Reggie Jackson once at an A's game. And I said, what's it like when they boo you? Oh, fans. When you show up and they boo you. Fans don't bow new buddies. And I said, because I know the feeling. I mean, I got 12,000 people blocked on Twitter and only 50,000 follow me. So, and he goes, you know what? They don't boo nobody. Oh, that's, I mean, that's my quote. They don't boo nobodies. And the reason that I want to help you and the reason that I'll do whatever I can to help you with your movement and educate people and help out Joe Sixpack is your movement threatens a lot of ingrained people, the establishment, who are very nervous about people getting a brain for themselves and thinking for themselves rather than being told what to do on CNBC, which I call the Cartoon Network. So uh, so before we get into this particular controversy and everything around it, your take on it, so I, that, that's the positive side. And so we get the full, you say everyone hates you. And like, well, if someone asks me, Dave, why do they, people like you? I can explain it. And the people who don't like you, what do they say you do wrong? For the people who hate you, what do, what do they say you're doing wrong? What, what are the criticisms against you? 
they say that I want the stock to go down and I'll make up whatever story I can to make money. That, yeah. that what, I'm, what I'm doing is engaging in a short and distort campaign and all I wanna do is make the stock go down. And I get about six to 16 DMs or emails a week from people who've lost it all over time in various names saying they wish they would have listened to me or discovered me earlier. And from, it has to do with Canada, Europe, the United States, et cetera. Well, you went head to head with Warren Buffett, right? In Canada, I read that. I, I've been head to head with the baddest act, the baddest guys on the planet and I fear nobody. And I can take on three, four, five. I just can't take on a million. I, I can't take on the whole world. So I try to pick my own spots very carefully and do my thing. But where I think where I think it gets important and where people get confused is I only like to see people do well. I don't want to see anyone fail. I would like to see everyone who follows you and, and invest on Robin. I'd like to see him win. But I think it's important for everyone to think for themselves and know what they're in and why. And just because you have a different view, and I don't agree with my friends sometimes, just because we have different opinions, facts are the facts. There's not Mark Cahota's facts or Dave Portnoy facts. The facts are the facts, but you and I can analyze the facts differently and that's what makes a market. The hate and wanting to shut people down and wanting to put down a movement and this, that, and the other is all bullshit. And the thing that scares me is that the Robin Hood crowd, and we can get into Robin Hood and their whole, their whole fiasco. The Robin Hood crowd is the equivalent of little leaguers up against Bob Gibson pitching because the SACs and the Citadels and the Tiger Cubs and the SAC spawns, these are nasty, ruthless motherfuckers who will stop at nothing to make a buck. And they're highly leveraged and they will do whatever it takes. And it's scary. And I've been up against these guys for 30 years and it's a dangerous ass game. So let me ask you this before we get in again, before we get into this, I'm curious your situation now. So I know you ran a big billion dollar fund. The way I read it, you basically were shorting. Uh, I think it was a real estate company in Canada. And then Warren Buffett swooped in, bought a lot of it, killed the short because everyone, if Warren gets in, it goes up. And, and, and this is my interpretation. And then that was the end of you running a fund and you went into business for yourself. Is that that's when I that's when I was in business for myself. I had fun with him on this thing in Canada. And the thing without him would have been bust. But before then, I had a big fund uh, where Goldman was my prime broker. And Goldman basically did to me, they they put me out of business because they changed my margin requirements. I wasn't leveraged. But what happened was when the market got volatile, Goldman asked for more and more and more collateral. And I kept posting collateral and they kept raising the requirements because Goldman did not have our shares borrowed. And it was easier to put me out of business than they admitted that they made a mistake. There's been books written about this. I'm in books. I'm in Harvard case studies. Anyone, there's real vision videos. Anyone watching this can easily Google me, Goldman Sachs. What what is what is shares borrowed me? I'm gonna ask some novice questions. They didn't have the shares borrowed. What does that mean exactly? So in the GME story, people get excited or flustered when they say there's 130% of the float short, right? There must be naked shorts. Naked shorting is illegal in the United States. It's flat out illegal. It's a crime. It's securities fraud. So your prime broker or Robinhood or E-Trade or interactive brokers has to borrow the shares before you can sell them. The government back in 2008 was very loosey goosey with this. And in the market, whatever you call it, turmoil of 08, passed a rule that you could only be non-borrowed for three days. And the brokerage firm was charging me huge vig to borrow the shares, but they never had it borrowed. Got it. So when the rule changed, instead of saying, hey, Mark, we fucked it up, they decided to put me out of business for a whole wide variety of reasons. 
And the, the main reason I don't do a fund anymore, although I'm asked probably 15 times a year, is there is nothing worse, nothing worse in my mind than losing people money. I don't give friends advice. I mean, my best pal is a lead singer of Collective Soul and they're always asking for stock advice. And I told them to buy some overstock a while back. I was in on it. Can we get a Collective Soul song on here ASAP so we can? <laughs> we can have the Collective Soul guys play at one of your functions when we eventually get the world open again. But anyway, when this thing wasn't doing well, I almost like couldn't even look at them. I almost couldn't look at them because I felt so bad. So when people say, don't take it personally, Mark, I take everything personally. I take it personally because it's, it's I'm on the line. I mean, I never look at anything I do well. Every day, even if I have a good day, I look at my mistakes. I look at, at everything I do wrong. I, I'm the hardest critic on myself that that's how i feel about pen now that that people are investing in it so i i feel that the, the and i keep saying one more thing i but i want to give the viewers at home the full picture on where you're at i'm always very frank with my financial situation and i consider myself very rich i'm not obviously like uh the cohen's and baseball teams i've done well with pen where are if i say i'm worth 100 million Am I, I, where are you in the world right now? You've been in finance. I always think finance guys are killing it. You're a short guy. You're sitting in your office. Have you made it? Are you like, where are you in the world right now? I'm le I'm less than a hundred, but you're well off. You know, I wear blue jeans. I wear wooden shoes from Sweden. I don't own a suit. I wear t-shirts and shorts. I have well, so does Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs never wore, but you're well off. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't need to work. I, okay. I do, I do this because I'm a jittery soul, and otherwise I would drive my wife nuts. And she says even when I do this, it's fighting with me is like fighting with chainsaws, juggling chainsaws. That's that's sort of me. I, I love the Oakland Raiders. I take care of my 34 year old disabled son. He lives on the property. And I, and I have a good life and I've lived a very fun, interesting existence. But when you short stocks or you go after troublemakers, you're not doing it for the money. People who teach kids in school don't do it for the money. They, they do it because they want to help people out. There's something that goes on where they want to give more back to society than for them. Okay, of okay. course, I'd rather win than lose. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to get the. I'm, I'm hugely, I'm hugely competitive, but but I'm not. I give, I give plenty, but I give more of myself in trying to help people out and make their lives better. Right. Well, I'm trying to again paint a picture for myself as well as everyone listening to figure out, you know. Who is this guy? Because it's widely interesting. The second I saw you, I'm like, oh, we got to get him on because the way he talks. But everyone always will say, and they say it with me when I'm, I'm getting killed right now because before I came on this show, I sold all my my Reddit stocks. And I lost probably 700 grand on all of it because I got in the day before. And I was like, oh, you're trying to pump the – everyone wants to figure out where everyone's coming from. So move it. Did you get a Collective Soul song for us, by the way? Can we just play it? I want to hear. Do you know who Collective Soul is? I know. I there's They're, one of those bands where I know them, but I don't. Oh no! This is not Collective Soul. This is uh. That's Collective Soul. This is Creed. No, <laughs> that's Creed. that's Collective Soul. That's the most popular. Oh, I mean, everybody knows this song. Yeah, that's my that's my buddy, and and I've been I've been divorced once, and I was traveling with him once in a bus in El Paso, and he wrote a song about my ex-wife called Exposed. So, so if I can't believe that I would have bet I would have lost all my four. I would have bet my life that was Creed. No. <laughs> so let's get in to what has just transpired with GameStop, uh, AMC, Melvin, Steve Cohen, who I chased off the internet. Now people are telling me I'm a bad guy for doing that, and everything else. You have heard. I I I'll give. I'm sure you've heard it. I've said this a million times. My thesis on this with no facts except using what i consider logic is melvin 
is shorting GameStop. The Reddit guys, Wall Street Bets, get together, and we're going to show this guy lesson and make money while doing it. Drives it astronomically, valuations out. Melvin's losing billions. Steve Cohen's firm jumps in, lends them money. The Citadel jumps in, lends the money, doesn't stop the bleeding, still going up. That money's going to be wasted. Melvin's going to go out of business. Robin Hood, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know much about the clearinghouse at the time, is making a shit ton of money with Citadel processing their trades. Also, Citadel's getting the information from Robin Hood on all, all these trades. So there's a close relationship with Robin Hood and the Citadel. The Citadel basically... Or phone calls, whatever happens behind the scenes, says enough and tells Robin Hood, we're done accepting trades and not. So we're now going to force the stock price down. You can only sell it. You can't buy it, which is a bananas thing. If they wanted to be fair, they would have said you can't buy, you can't sell, freeze it and then figure it out. Vlad goes on CNBC. No validity. He says, we don't have a liquidity issue. It has nothing to do with liquidity. This is a preemptive move by us to figure out what's going on. Three days later, he reverses and says it was a liquidity issue. Sounds like then he's saying what you said earlier, what Goldman did, saying we need need more money from you. We need $3 billion. It's a 180 from Vlad. And what happened behind the scenes? Not 100% sure on my end, but I am convinced the guys we've mentioned, the Melvins, the Citadels, the Steve Cohens, made calls, played a hand, and forced whatever happened. And if it was reversed, and the hedge funds and those guys were making all the money, it they wouldn't have pressed pause in the game. And I think it's criminal, and I think people, I can lose money, but people who got in got screwed because these aren't on the computers every day. If you invested in this, I keep saying this to people, it was everyday people. By the time people started getting in on this internet movement, it was the Joe six packs. It was people like, oh, I'm going to get on this. They knew there was risk. They didn't know you could stop trading. That's something I didn't know you could do. And the rules change midstream. People lose their money because they forced the price down. And I do believe it's criminal behavior. I do not believe Robin Hood was acting alone. I think they knew once they did this, their company was done as they as they built it and claimed to be because you can't come back breaking that trust. And now, obviously, everyone's going to come up with the excuses because nobody commits a crime or does something illegal or shady and says, yeah, I did that. That's why I don't get to Steve Cohen. People are like, why did you mention him as well? He was at the center of the biggest fine in the history of the SEC. That's where I think of my, I still think my original hypotheses is basically true. That's where I'm at. Where are you at on this thing? I'm where you're I'm where you're at, but I can fill in some blanks which I think can give you a little more conviction. I have a lot of conviction so I can't wait for these blanks. I'll 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 I'll, I'll add in some details which is why I want to appear on the hearings and I'll read the people when we're done the letter that my attorneys wrote the Senate and the Congress the other day, if the shoe was on the other foot and I was short GameStop at 310, right? Short it. And me and my buddies did all sorts of stuff to knock the price of the stock down and this, that, or the other, we would have been arrested. We would have been arrested in five minutes. We, We would be charged with every crime. They'd say, these guys are financial terrorists, this, that, or the other. When Robinhood stopped trading in the stock for the customers who owned it, that to me is a huge problem. That is a huge problem, especially when the guy said he didn't need money. So there's something called a VAR, which is value at risk. Let's say the three of us are running Robinhood and I'm the CEO, you're the head of operations and you're the CFO. I'd say, hey, Portnoy, what's our VAR and GameStop? How much exposure do we have? And you'd say, hey, Mark, we got about 4 billion. I'd say, you know, that's a little too much for my liking. Why don't we take people's margin up to 200% on GameStop or 200% on AMC or 200% on BB? That way 
we're not stopping trading. We're not, we're not telling people they can't trade, but what we'll do is we'll raise the price of poker that if you want to trade, this is a very risky bet. You need to have more money in the account, at which point you either put more money in the account and buy more or, or you say, tap me out. Yeah. And let yeah. And occasionally I may just stop to, to, break it down for what I would consider dummies because I'm relatively new to this. And Eddie, I'm sure you're I'm a, a dummy. dummy. I'm a dummy. So when you say margin, here's what you can do, which I learned quickly. So I put in, let's say I'm in E-Trade or I'm in Trade Zero, which I use now. I put in $5 million. They, they let you trade above that. Borrow money that say I have five million cash, but I can buy twelve million dollars worth of stock. Essentially, you so can buy you can you can buy fifteen million. Fifteen million. So they give you the extra. It's and if you lose it, then you're called on it. I learned early. Sometimes I would stay over margin like too much, or and I'd have to cut a check the next day or within three days, like he said, to prove I have the capital to cover so like what I'm doing. Line? So that is margin. That's what he means. Raise basically interest rate on it is what you're saying, well, essentially. You, you, you basically say, if I'm the house, right, and, and the brokerage firms are the house. I mean, this is very casino-esque. Yeah, it's exactly casino-esque. This is very casino-esque. So the house basically says, the situation is very volatile. And because it's volatile, the house doesn't want risk, right? We don't want you to tap out and go bust and leave us with debt. Therefore, you need to put in more capital. Yes. Where Robin Hood went afoul. Robin Hood is a gimmick. Robin Hood probably shouldn't be in business because they misled the people, they misled their customers on exactly what they do. And the Stevie Cones and the Melvins and his crew used those people or thought those people were easy marks. It's Bob Gibson pitching against little leaguers, right? It's not a fair fight. He thought those guys were easy marks. And what happened was the easy marks got it right on GME in a very big way and cost these guys absolute fortunes, absolute fortunes. So much so that the Melvin guy should be out of business. Melvin should be out of business. He, he was over leveraged. He was arrogant. He was greedy. He made a bad bet. When you make a bad bet and you're wrong, you should lose. You should give up your right to be in this business because you because you cause the system irreparable damage, which is why the market sold off so hard last week. Everyone was saying this Robin Hood could be a Lehman like event. So let me ask you this. When you when you say he made a bad bet and he lost my interpretation, which I, I it he basically underestimated the Internet. Like you don't believe the GME or any of those evaluation. This was a viral moment, right? That he just didn't see coming. Well, well, I've talked to someone extraordinarily sophisticated, much smarter than me. And, and this person would lead you to believe that there was some very big money behind this to squeeze SAC and to squeeze the hell out of Melvin. And they fomented the Reddit boards to sort of encourage it and build it up to create this kind of moment to create this kind of bluster and they've really created bluster. All right. I mean, a hundred percent. They really created the tempest in the teapot. And I think the good thing about the upcoming investigations and hopefully I'm part of it, even though in my letter, I said I had, I had no position ever in GM GME or AMC long or short or any of these other names. It's important to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. Who knew what, where, who pulled the strings so this bullshit doesn't happen again. So, but, but what you're saying then, it sounds like if there's people behind the theory, behind the Wall Street bets, I mean, in a weird way, that's, and again, it's within the rules as they're set up in my mind, but that's every bit as behind the curtain. Like the, like the Melvin guys or whoever who made this bad bet, this was, the, they, they fell victim to something in my mind that you couldn't see coming. Well, let's, let's just say this. And, and again, on the part of it is, I short stocks 
used to for a living. There have been books written about me and Harvard Business School cases written about me. I am a badass when it comes to this neck of the woods. I've been doing this for a long time and I know how it works. What happened is when you're short GME, which is a so-called dying retailer from 50, you cover it at three. There's a guy who told me way back when, Mark, people would pay $3 just to see two rats fuck. And he's right. When a stock goes down to three, two, four, whatever, you cover it and you move on. These guys got greedy. These guys got arrogant. These guys said the company is going to go out of business. And maybe it does go out of business. But at three, you cover your short, you go home, you don't get greedy. And, and that's that, right? These guys overstayed their welcome. And someone, you know, behind the scenes or the Reddit guys made them pay a heavy price. Now, they never thought the stock would go from four to 400. Right. You know, they probably didn't think it would go from four to 30. But as things get carried away, things get carried away. And, and it blows through all computer models and it blows through all risk profiles. And before you know it, this thing gets contagion. It spreads. It spreads to all other short names. And you have an absolute fiasco. And, and, and I would bet. My betting is it's far more sinister than you think. I'll bet you that the prime brokers, Goldman, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Citadel, called the New York Fed, who controls all this shit, and said, you guys better get these motherfuckers at Robin Hood in line because they're about ready to blow the system, right? We don't have $15 billion to piss away. And if Citadel, who's 10 to 20 times leverage, starts getting dinged, then we could really have a problem. So you get these ass clowns at Robin Hood in line, you tell them to straighten up and fly right, you know, now, now, right? Because this shit came without warning, unless Citadel knew about it, unless SAC knew about it. And this is the important part of the hearings. This is very important. And this is what you need to push for and I need to push for. You can't let a crisis go by with just a, oh, boys will be boys. And, you know, it happened once, it'll never happen again. Until people get hauled off and put in jail or punished severely, this will go on and on and on and on. Goldman pays billions in fines, billions over 20 years. They never won admit guilt. No one's ever sent away to prison. They make so much damn money. It's like a tax to them. That's exactly what I said. You know, and, and if Stevie Cohn pays a billion dollars, doesn't go to jail for insider trading, this, that, and the other, he still owns the New York Mets. So he could lose it all. From now to kingdom come, he still has the New York Mets. And Melvin owns part of the Charlotte Hornets. And he owns two new places in Miami. And, and this is through, this is through, Dave, excessive use of leverage excessive leverage and something that that again if they want to hear me out instead of taxing joe six-pack or people like yourself more they should have an excessive leverage tax anyone who uses too much leverage whether you're a hedge fund brokerage firm broker dealer who have you you should pay a high frequency trading tax an excessive leverage tax to cut all this bullshit out so joe six-pack is not hitting the back of the head with a shovel when he goes out and takes a pee behind the bushes, which is exactly what happened. I mean, CNBC will brag, oh, you know, the, the Robin Hooders lost and, you know, it's a lesson in this, that, and the other bullshit. The Robin Hooders in this movement is not going away anytime soon, just like your movement to disrupt sports is not going away anytime soon. The people who disrupt the first people through the wall are always the people who get busted up, bruised and battered, always. People who speak truth to power pay a heavy price. I know this. Well, I, 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 yeah, and I, I would say the Robin Hoods didn't lose. They were cheated. I mean, they, the, the rules changed mid game. That, that's why the late ones lost. Now, what about the argument and I've heard a couple different people say it. Like, if this didn't change and people start getting, and you alluded to it, like, 
and you always hear this. You've heard this since the the housing, the bailouts. If the banks go down, if the financial system goes down, everything goes down. So that's why you have what what it, do you believe that? Well, it's complete bullshit. And 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 my thing that. is the my thing is the market's at an all time high, plus or minus. Brokerage firms, hedge funds, broker dealers like Citadel. I mean, Ken Griffin is worth. 20 plus billion. I mean, this, this guy's worth a fortune and, and he just bought a billion dollars of property. He's worth a fortune, right? This is the time Wall Street and the high frequency traders and people who use excessive leverage should have the live and be Jesus taxed out of them. And that money should go into a pool, right? A pool that sits there in case this kind of bullshit happens again, you don't have to worry about the system going under. Right. That's what insurance is for. You pay your insurance when everything's great. And when the shit hits the fan, you collect on insurance. That way, if this instance were to happen again, you say, Melvin, you used excessive leverage. You completely fucked up. You're down. That's it. Here you go. Thanks for playing. Bye. The system's fine. Rather than using this excuse that bad behavior keeps getting bailed out. You can't keep bailing out bad behavior, Dave. You can't bail it out. And then the crazy part of this narrative, which is why I'm so goddamn pissed off, and my lawyers wrote a letter to, to the government, is that the guys to blame are not the three people who short stocks who expose criminals and bad behavior. The guys to blame are these hedge fund guys, the broker dealers who allow it, the people who use excessive margin. And when you get to these guys at Citadel, who to me are the worst of the worst, the worst of the worst, they know everyone's order flow. They're, they're the casino watching everyone play open-handed poker. They know everyone's cards. They know everyone's chips. They know everyone's line of credit. And they can go and short stack everyone into oblivion. If, you know, if, you're, if they go put $2 billion with Melvin, they know exactly what Melvin's doing. And they know exactly what Melvin's pals are doing. And if they're doing order flow for Robin Hood, they know exactly what the Robin Hood guys are doing. So if you have both sides of the trade and you know where everyone's exposure is, how do you lose? And when you say they stopped Robin Hood trading that day, that just didn't happen in a vacuum. People knew about it. And if you say, hey, Robin Hood's gonna stop all buy side activity in these five names, yeah, the stocks will go down. Yeah, the stocks will get killed without notice. And without notice is what happened to me. And, and when you lose or lose and or cheated, right? I'm a man and I'm a stand up guy. And if I mess up, I'll say I fucked it up, right? And I was the captain of the ship and we lost and I'm in charge and I fucked it up. Now they're extenuating circumstances of Goldman, but I'll stand up and be accounted for. When you lose, you lose. Were these people defrauded and cheated? Fuck yeah. But at the end of the day, and, and I have this quote of the day that I, that I always, you know, sometimes I read it every morning. It's from April 5th, 2000 in the New York Times. It says, quote of the day, the lesson is gonna be the market is not a game. The market is not a casino. It's a serious thing for serious people. And if you're wrong, be prepared to lose. Mark Cahota, general partner of Rocker Partners. That was 21 years ago. And the same thing is true today. The problem is they beat back the man. They beat back Joe Sixpack unfairly. See, I disagree with that. I agree with a lot of what you've just said. But I actually believe the, the way the stock market is now it is a casino and it is a game and the guys on Robin Hood treated it like that and so do the Melvin guys and so do the Citadel guys except when they start losing they're like it's not a game and blame the Robin Hood guys but to me it's just everyone it is a game for for the guys the the big hedge funds and the billionaires until it doesn't work in their favor and then they pull back and say wait a minute this we're treating it like a casino and that's not right even though that's what they do i use the analogy bob gibson pitching to little leaguers yeah right bob gibson was the baddest man i've ever watched play baseball 
he was outstanding. I mean, I'm 60, you're younger than me, but I saw him play live and he was outstanding. Could he pitch to 12 year olds and 12 year olds hit it? Yeah, he could pitch batting practice to 12 year olds, no doubt. But if it got serious, right? And if the lights were on, they couldn't touch him. And when it got serious for the SACs and the Citadels and the broker dealers, these guys tipped the game on Joe Sixpack and Joe Sixpack got fucked, right. got absolutely fucked. The market needs to be fair for all parties. It needs to be fair for me, you, people who listen to you, Robin Hooders, E-Traders, professionals. It needs to be fair. We do not operate in a banana republic where if it doesn't go well you tip it in the favor of someone else i mean the bullshit has to stop and 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 the problem and the fallout from all this is everyone is gonna you know people who lose on gme or you know the guy with a tie wrapped around his head he made 50 million dollars it's important you know the message that i have to everyone who follows it it's important to understand what you're in why you're in it there is risk to it and you need to have comfort in it because it when things go bad, you need to have conviction. You have great conviction in pen. I admire you and I respect you. I don't always agree with you, but when people were trying to pound pen down into oblivion, when it was three or four and they say it's going under, you stood your ground and it fucking sucks. It sucks to have the game taken to you and the living shit beat out of you. And it's happened to me more times than I ever, ever, ever remember. But you know what? You stood tall. You knew what you were in. You knew why you owned it. You knew the asset. And you've been amazingly successful. The stock's gone from three to 100 and some odd. So let me ask you. Let me ask you this then, and I cut you off a little bit. We we have the same general thesis. One thing you said earlier, you'll help fill in the blanks to take it from thesis to more maybe concrete. So what are what are those things that you can fill in? So uh, there was a lot of option activity in in uh, GME, and I'm not really an option guy. But if you have a normal stock, a normal stock, it trades at, let's say, a 40 vol. If you have a volatile stock, it'll trade at 130. I think GME in the salad days last week was trading as high as 1400. There's huge money to be made selling this premium if you have a handle on where the stock is going. And I think what needs to be brought into light is Citadel's exposure. And Citadel has a hedge fund group. They have a proprietary trading group. They have a market making group. They have an execution group with Robinhood. It's going to be very interesting if I were the SEC to subpoena all of Citadel's trades all of Melvin's trades, all of everyone's trades in this loop and see who is either running, running in front of this or facilitating it. Because I do not believe this was just chance. I do not believe this is coincidence. A former SEC enforcement attorney where I did cases with them, I brought them ideas and they prosecuted people who did this shit. He called me on a Saturday night and said, whatever you do, do not let up on these motherfuckers. He said they are dirty to the core and they're extraordinarily leveraged. And, and something in my mind went down. Something went down deeper than what you think. And it's very strange that Citadel would put $2 billion into a failing hedge fund. Why didn't they just let Melvin fail? Why would Citadel put $2 billion in a failing operation? That's not like Ken Griffin. He'd, he'd sell his mother for very little money. I mean, these guys are ruthless. So why would you put $2 billion into a failing hedge fund? SAC already had a billion dollars in. But the problem is they needed to know what Melvin and Melvin wannabes were doing and their exposure. And if these guys ran in front of it, I think they'll be held to pay. There will be held to pay, I think, because 
everyone should be outraged. Everyone should be sick and tired of it. And, and the markets are fair as long as everyone was dealt with fairly. And I was sort of okay with everything until Robin Hood did the one-way trade and your man Vlad got on TV and said he didn't need any money as he goes and takes $3 billion. You can't do that. You either don't go on TV, you put out a statement, but you don't go on TV and you lie to people. You don't look straight ahead to the Cartoon Network, AKA CNBC, and say, we don't need any money, we're fine, knowing full fucking well you're not fine, right? You just don't do it, you just say nothing. You say, well, we're gonna get through this, we'll be fine, we're raising margin requirements, we'll raise capital, we'll do whatever. They're, they don't have a stock, they're a private company. But the, but the part that gets me is it wasn't the fat cats, ex Melvin losing and his hedge fund buddies. It was, it was Joe six pack. And it was the people, the few people left who are actually short stocks righteously trying to do the right thing who are now ground down to nothing. So I have a pal, his name is Jim Carruthers and he'll probably be out of business. And he's about my age. He's probably 63, 64. And this motherfucker did serious, significant work. He exposed this INSYS, which was this fentanyl scam, which probably killed tens of thousands of people. And if not for him, probably 100,000 people would have died or more. And this guy to me is a hero. And he's going to go out of business because of this nonsense that Melvin did. And that's a sad day. The markets are worse for not having a Carruthers around. And society is worse for not having a guy like him around. And it hurts me. And, and I just want to make sure that the few people who are left doing this kind of work still have a platform to do it. And they're not the enemy of the little guy. They're the friend of the little guy. The enemy of the little guy are the guys in the Hamptons, the guys who own the fucking sports teams, the guys who, you know, Leon Black, who does his pedo shit with the late Epstein, those kind of guys. Those are the guys who need their lives interrupted and changed and need to be held accountable for the shit that goes on, which is this excessive leverage. If there wasn't, ex if there wasn't excessive leverage in the system, this wouldn't have happened. None of this would have happened. All right. And, and, and that's, you know, that's what I think. That's that, what I feel. That was a very good wrap up. Very interesting. We'll probably talk to you again in the future, but I appreciate you coming on short notice. It was fascinating. I think that was it for Eddie, for somebody like you who didn't know anything about it. It's kind oh, of yeah. like a very good rap. Great so job. I appreciate it. We'll stay in touch. I'm sure our, our listeners are going to love this and have a lot of feedback. So thank you. Yeah, anything I can do to help, let me know. And thanks for having me. Keep fighting the good fight. All right, I'll talk to you That's later. That's the plan. Thanks, Bob. All right, bye. Yeah, bye. So what'd you think of him? So it was good. So uh, you, you tell me if this comparison's is fair or not because like i said i'm the dummy it's it's like boxing okay you the these hedge funds they bet a mayweather minus five thousand and joe public they rally around this guy they get someone in the ring and he's he's giving it to mayweather but that's where the judges step in that's citadel the ref that's melvin the commission and they get fucked over something like that that's what it felt like to me. Like, and I say boxing because it's so fucking corrupt in itself already. Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit. I mean, to be honest, he and I. I don't think he has the facts. Just like I, uh, the proof. Like I think he said he could fill in some blanks. His underlying thesis is exactly what mine is. This just didn't happen. There's too many huge power players involved. All the connections. All the behind the scenes. There's too much. Something illegal happened. The margin thing. He's right. Um, you know. I don't even know the point of margin now that we talk about it, but it is no different than going to a casino and a casino, you know, borrowing money to somebody like, uh Oh, this guy's getting killed. He's not going to be able to pay and we're going to halt it. And it, it's just behind the scenes. I, he obviously has an ax to grind. Mm -hmm. You know, he hates, hates these big guys and he's had controversy, but smart, interesting guy, but he has the general underlying theme that I do that something very shady went down. And I believe it. And I don't think anybody will be held accountable, which I've said the only way to hurt these guys is to put them in jail. Fines and whatnot. Steve Cohen wrote a billion-dollar fine, doesn't care. Uh, Ken Griffin, Citadel, can write a $10 billion fine, doesn't care. But I don't think anything's going to come of it. 
I really don't. Oh, and that's like, and you said too, and and you said it seemed like you guys aligned, but he's throwing a stick in the spoke, and you know half the people who are on their side are like, well, he's doing that because he's just trying to take us down, he's trying to come against the system, and then all of us are like, no, he's doing it to do the right thing. So yeah, uh, who knows? Interesting interview. Yeah, uh, Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter. Businesses have had to uh, be flexible this past year from working remotely to pivoting their business models for long-term survival and growth. Uh, If you're in charge of hiring for your business, these pivots have made made your job even more challenging, especially if you have to hire for brand new roles. Thankfully, there's one place that you can always count on making hiring faster and easier, ZipRecruiter.com slash Barstool. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job boards with one click. Then ZipRecruiter's powerful technology finds people with the right skills and experience for your job, actively invites these people to apply. It's no wonder that four out of five employees who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Barstool. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Barstool. B-A-R-S-T-O-O-L. I'm losing my voice here. Let ZipRecruiter take finding qualified candidates off your plate so you can focus on growing your business. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Barstool. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. You got the club voice or what? I got a little cold, not Corona, just a little cold. Miami. How uh, do we have water? Can I grab one? Are you interested in the stock market shit? Yeah, so I think you can't avoid it right now, you know? So, and obviously you're into it. And obviously I think a lot of our demographic is too. So I lost $700,000. And you sold, right? Sold it this morning. And you said people are on your ass? Yeah, because I originally I'm like, I'm going to hold till I'm deaf. But, you know, I, I, got smashed what happened to me happened to a lot of people i got involved in it the day before robin hood said oh we're gonna put the pause button on what's going on that you can only sell the stock you can't buy it that's cratering the stock they had to know it would happen and i got involved because like i believe in the power of the internet i believe that you can create movements and go viral and it wasn't going to stop i didn't know you could change the rules and my main contention is if the shoe is on the other foot, and that's what he's saying, it would not have stopped. If the Melvins, the Citadels were making billions, they would have kept on making billions, and the little guy would get crushed. The only reason they stopped it was because the establishment, and I do agree, there were probably phone calls made all over the place behind the scenes to stop it because the institutional players were in trouble. That's what I believe. Yeah, because like he said, they had all this money tied into something that they never thought in their wildest dreams could be taken down. Like it took a revolution of a fucking message board. Correct. To do it. So they're so they're such in a position where it's like, yeah, this is we'll throw all our money in this. Like, yeah, it might not be it could crash and burn, but it would take one hell of a fucking. Well, I don't think that you could ever imagine it. And I've said this on different shows. I think there will have to be legislation in the future to prevent against whatever happened. Whether you halt stocks, you don't let people buy and sell. And I think for Vlad, besides the fact he lied, the biggest complaint is if you're going to stop letting people buy it, they can't sell it. Freeze it. And if people want to get out at that price or do whatever, they can do that. Figure it out. But what they did is they crashed it. And that's the number one complaint most people have. But... I listen, everybody plays by the same rules. And in this case, for the first time in a long time, the little guy took advantage of the rules. It was making money hand over fist, like roaring kitty and guys like that. That's fair. Good for them. They did it for years, decades. It's been the big guys, the Melvins and high frequency trading and getting information and having both sides of the trades and everything. He said, they've taken advantage of that to build empires. And now the other guy took advantage and it becomes unfair. That's where I think the problem is. Yeah, and that's where I'm just, I'm interested, yes, but in the same coin, I just know these people are untouchable almost, man. They're untouchable. And that's why I'm just like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I'm sure you saw the George Carlin clip that has been going around. Whitney posted it. Like, they run everything, dude. You're not taking down Ken Griffey. You're not taking down Steve Cohen. And he brought up Epstein. I mean, it's the same shit They're that went on with him. Like, you can't 
it's an unwinnable game. Even I'm surprised even the Cohen. Um, and I don't know if that's on the sheet at all. That is. It is. Actually, it's the first thing. We, we can hop right into it because we're going to go into kind of – that was great information for people that really are deep into it and want to get to know what's going on. Here's more about, like, your role in everything. So, the first thing, obviously, you went at Steve Cohen on Twitter. He deleted it. So Yeah, so Steve Cohen lent Melvin Capital – he was already invested a billion in Melvin Capital and then lent them, I think, a couple more billion to try to bail them out. So – my hypothesis was he he placed phone calls, put pressure, leverage. He's off. He's literally billions is based on him. It's based on Steve Cohen, and he's tweeting and he had a couple sarcastic tweets like "Oh, tough day for traders" and things like that. Playing along, fine. I have no problem with that. Um, but to not so so I basically said I think he's involved, and if he is, he should go to jail, and I stand by that. I have no proof he's involved. I'm using common sense. And his past history. Anybody, and this is just Mets fans. I don't know where KFC was on it. Mets fans like, how dare people are. He said people were attacking his family and kids on Twitter. Obviously, you should never do that. It has nothing to do with his family and kids. It's just him. Um, and who knows how many people actually did. I mean, you know, people are new to Twitter. I mean, people attack yeah. me all the time on Twitter. Who knows? Whatever. You should never do that. But you can't act like woe is me that people are are looping you into this thing that's your history you've been levied the biggest fine in the history of the sec for insider trading you're directly connected to melvin capital of course people are going to mention you of course people are so to me that's a no-brainer you're you're doing a disservice not to raise that question yeah and i mean he's i'm sure he's heard noise about his career and stuff and all the fines and everything but him signing up for twitter was a direct line to him to say like, hey, what the fuck, dude? Correct. You know, so of course you're gonna hear. I mean, you. What's you listen, going on? I get it. I get the negative stuff, and, and it's not even to that degree. But he was levied the biggest fine in the history of SEC. He is now involved in, or directly has direct relationships to what I would say is the biggest stock market scandal since I've been aware of like stock market. Really, of course he's gonna be mentioned. I believe he's so powerful you don't even know what the hell's going on. And like you said. It's like the Whitney, the Carlin. He's one of those guys who I would legitimately be afraid of. He's like, we're just going to get this guy. He could get me. That's how powerful I think he is. Yeah, that's why I'm surprised that you go so deep into this. I, I found it fascinating. Yeah, but you're not afraid at all? The only people I've ever been afraid of is Anonymous. <laughs> Rightfully so. Because they tweeted at me one time. They are coming for me, and I fucking tucked tail and got the fuck out of there. I remember that. I'm That's like, all right, hand up. What do you want me to do? You want to cut my dick off? I'll cut it off. <laughs> oh, no. Rightfully so, dude. They, and you asked, I wonder terrifying. if Steve Cohen, I doubt he would. I wonder if he'd come on. I mean, he seems, you know, it's weird because with the Mets thing, he seems like a, like an outgoing, like, down-to-earth guy. I had a back and forth with him. He said he had nothing to do with it. Do you take him as his word? I don't know personally. I just know what I read. I know his history. And I do think he's a ruthless guy who would stop at nothing to make a buck. I'm afraid of these people. Ken Griffin, is he's Chicago's richest person. He He's bought so much property in Miami. And, and I am, I'm as connected in Miami as any city. I wouldn't be surprised if down the road, like I don't get into a party or something because of that. Yeah, he, like he he's huge. These are these are the guys who run the country who are doing um, what I would eyes wide shut parties that you don't know exist. Dude, yeah, exactly. That's why I was like, man, because you hear stories about what. But that's why I think the people who are who are carrying the water for these for this being like, oh, it's just a liquidity issue and nothing illegal happened. How do you believe that? How can anybody truly believe that? I mean, most people. I mean, the, come on, the CEO of Robinhood, he. What's his involvement? You know? I think he's What's... a pawn. I think he's a little fish. Yeah. I, mean, I think yeah. he I, I think he became a puppet for them. They can control him. They had him under his thumb and and kind of what was just said by Mark. Mark, what, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Th that w you're going to stop this. And I don't know who did it or who applied the pressure or what happened. But again, it, like I was on um, Cuomo yesterday. And Cuomo was like, it was clearly a liquidity issue. It had to be a liquidity issue. It's like, well, why won't you just say that the first time? He didn't. He said the exact opposite. He actually totally lied. He said, we are preemptive. 
It was a, it was not liquidity. It was too volatile. We preemptively stopped it. Three days later, he said they got a call at 3 a.m. and owed $3 billion. Like, what changed in that storytelling? I refuse to believe that the Melvins, the Citadels, the Steve Cohens, all the way down to where there's Lehman, everybody, the only people who are winning were the internet people. What do you think of Keith Olbermann jumping into the fire with you? He's a nobody. I, I actually, at times, am amazed how the, sh- like, the shoe has turned, the world has turned, or whatever has turned. Like, Oberman now chirps at me, and I'm like, Psh, get away, little guy. Yeah. Like, you know, imagine watching Oberman growing up be like, oh, I'm going to yeah. be so much bigger, more influential, more powerful in every respect than Keith Oberman. And, and I mean, that's just the facts. I am. I mean, you're right. 10 years ago, 2010, he says something bad about the Red Sox. You'd be fucking chirping down on Twitter. Right, tire. yes. <laughs> like you see what Oberman said? Yeah, and he'd be like, ah, oh, it's just like yeah, a fan. Exactly right. a right. small I mean, Oberman is an ant. Yeah. So I, di- I didn't even, it didn't even, it did not. I'm like, oh, Oberman, whatever. Yeah, and he's so far off the reservation at this point that I think a lot of people join you yeah. in, that, in that thought. But Cuomo, so you went on there. What did you think? Did you think like you got a fair shake? That was your first time in that. So it was kind of, uh, I don't know, breaking ground, kind of a crossover. I've all, what have I always said? I'll go on any yep, show, yep. anytime, anywhere. They invited me on. I was like, it'll be a little interesting because I think his brother has done a horrific job, obviously, like the small business fund and whatnot. You know, a lot of that. I didn't know if any of that was going to be brought up. I would have had to say something about that. Not negative. People don't get this about me. And it's the same thing with Trump when I went and did him or Cuomo or anybody. If I'm invited on, I'll never gut you. Like, you're inviting me on your platform. I'm going to be polite and civil. I'll say my point of view. But I'm never going on to, like, create a fight unless it's taken to me. Um, I thought it was good. People thought, I mean... He and I clearly have very different views of the world. Like when he was questioning me, don't I feel a responsibility to the people who follow me? And I believe people aren't infants, I think is what I said. You can make your own decision. I use that John Deere analogy, which I did when I was in the Hamptons. I saw a deer and I invested in John Deere because I saw a deer. If someone's going to invest because of that, well, then you're a moron beyond help. Like you can do it, but don't be like, you said that would go up. So, you know, a different perspective, but I thought it was well. It kind of looked to me like he was feeling you out. You he know? texted me after. He's like, uh, we had a couple of text exchanges after. He's like, thanks for coming on. He's like, thanks for having me anytime. He's like, how do you think it went? Or how are people reacting? I'm like, it's um, a lot of people are talking about it. They were killing him. Yeah. I'm like, some, and, and he's like, what does that mean? I'm like, a few people like you, a lot of people hate you. But that's predetermined. Unfortunately, CNN and Fox News are both political and the people who like CNN will like when I go on people like Fox will hate and it's vice versa. That's just the word. It sucks for both. And I've always said that I hate politics, but I'll go on either side. Yeah. And, and, and listen, whether you want to splice it or not, like you, your, your Fox counter is much higher than CNN at this point. Right. So he, he knows where he lies and he knows where a lot of his audience lies. I think. So I think he, had to be in a position where, like, I'm going to have Dave on, but, like, I at least kind of make it, got to make it a little tough on him. I at I least got to. I have no problem with tough questions. Yeah. And, but did you get that sense, too, where it's like he. Yeah, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to roll yes. over and yes. let, let me pet his belly or anything mm-hmm. like that. But I thought it was fair. I don't need, I consider myself, especially on subjects <laughs> like this, I've been in it enough where I. You can ask me anything. Nothing's going to stump me. I, I'll go toe-to-toe with anybody anything. It's like when people have problems with things I've said, the people who hate me in the past, like, let's talk about it. I'm pretty confident I can win any argument because I believe in – now someone watching it may be like, oh, you lost that argument, but I think I won because I think I make rational, coherent points. So it and there's nobody like, who can convince me that this wasn't an inside job. So it sounds like you'll probably get invited back. I have no idea. Yeah. I think I've done a couple CNNs. Yeah, with Julia. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I tried to hit on her. It didn't go well. <laughs> on on the show, live on the show. After after I sent her DM. <laughs> That's like. Uh, but it was bird. very like nice. <laughs> it wasn't like I didn't want to be like me too. Would you say? Thanks for having me on. 
I live in New York. You live in New York or something. But it was, I said it in a couchy. It wasn't. I didn't want to be like, oh, creep. But she seems like a funny, nice, smart lady, pretty, who likes me. And I got ghosted, though. She didn't say anything? Not to that, she didn't. Oh. So I may never go back on there. Again. No. Which is, I'm surprised you did that, did that to be honest. Got to meet people somehow, Eddie. <laughs> I think you meet a lot of people. Um, on that, on, on the flip side too, your Tucker appearance, uh, were you taking a lot of heat for your headphones? You tucked him into your sweater. They made me do that. Oh, really? They had me do it. To, listen, they brought somebody to my hotel room, like a crew and whatever device they had didn't work. So they're like, do you have headphones? So I had no choice. Oh, I saw it. I like, what is, what is he doing? It reminded me of. Back in the day when, remember, everyone said you were an ear tucker in your hat? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, they just told me I'd do it. I, like, but I, I didn't care about that, Eddie. I was glad because it gave me an excuse to post that picture. That's the best I've ever looked. Really? I was I looked like a male model in that. In that. The <laughs> yeah. lighting was spectacular. And I'm not one of those people that hates on fucking cords. People call it whatever, poverty strings and whatnot. But, I, you know, it was just funny that they were that they were tucked into your sweatshirt. But that makes sense if they made you do that. Uh, this Chamath guy. He donated five hundred thousand dollars of the profit he made to the Barstool Fund. Yep. Have you talked to him? I don't really know much about him. I never heard heard of him till then. Looks like he's going to run for governor or something in uh, California. But a nice gesture, and we appreciate it clearly. Also, on that note, Dave Dobrik, he's his to the moon shirts and sweatshirts. He's donating all that to the fund as well. Did you know that? No. Yeah. When did that happen? So I guy sent me a, a text or a DM from the Viva account. Maybe maybe Jack could pull it up, where he said uh, he's going to donate all that too. And I, I, Dave Dobrik's one of those guys I'm not fully familiar with. I know he's huge. Dobrik's but, gigantic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. How have I not? When did that happen? I found out like an hour ago. Okay, so two days or so ago, Jack just said. Huh. Awesome. I wish I knew that. Yeah. So that's great. It, it, what I don't know is like to the moon. Is that from me? I, I mean, I would say, but it, at what point, like I saw too, it, I should have brought this up a couple of weeks ago. I'm pretty sure Levitard's new thing is called like pirate media. Like he's calling it the pirate ship. So it's at some point, a lot of these things just kind of cross over, right? I, mean, I just, like, uh, well, I, that's like the word hardo. I hear that all the time. And every time I'm like, I invented that. And people look at me like I'm crazy, <laughs> but I have the receipts. And people still don't know the definition. Huh. It's a great sweatshirt. Yeah. But I mean, that's own the moon to the moon. That's been my thing since For a long like time. day one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. At least since the churn and buy. At least since then. Got to give a shout out to Dukes. A newer Getting hire that here. Yeah. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. He was on BBC. Um, he was the front page of CNBC. Had his pen sign. Had a Robin Crook sign, I think it said. Uh, I mean, that was great as a new guy. That's kind of what you like to see, right? Are you low energy? Are you sick? No, I. You seem low energy. I'm you you're the one who told me you got the sniffles. No, I'm all right. No. I'm just checking. I got a one o'clock just as a heads up. All right, we're good. We'll we'll be done by then. Um let's talk about Roman real quick, Dave, and then we could we could get into some inside bar stool topics. I got a big Valentine's Day special coming up. Well yeah, it's Valentine's Day is coming up, so your dick's gonna be hard as fuck. For a limited time, Roman has special offers to make sure you're ready for Valentine's Day. Get up to $35 off your first month of ED treatment if prescribed. And if you purchase swipes, you'll get a free bottle of lube added to your order while supplies last. Good deal there. Who doesn't want some free lube? The whole process is straightforward, simple, discreet. One less thing you have to worry about on Valentine's Day. For a limited time, get up to $35 off your first month of ED treatment if prescribed. If you purchase swipes, you'll get a free bottle of lube added to your order while supplies last. Complete your online visit by 210 for guaranteed, guaranteed delivery by V-Day. Just go to GetRoman.com slash Portnoy to get started. That's GetRoman.com slash Portnoy. Hard dicks. 
There we go. The Hard last picks. of the hearts. Loop, swipes, get it all. Roman's the best. Um, all right. Before all the Robin Hood shit went down, there was the NWHL shit that went down. They came at Erica. Whole big thing. You made a press conference. Uh, has there been anything since then? I know they deleted the tweet, but. Well, so that all went down, and I, I saw Erica getting attacked. And, you know, I waited. I didn't say anything in the beginning because a couple thoughts went through my head. Do you want a man defending a woman in this situation optically because of the haters? Do I, if I get involved, it always becomes a bigger issue. So I actually asked Erica because I hate, I want to come out like, fuck these people. And she's like, yeah, no, say what you want. I appreciate it. So I made the video and, and I stand by everything I said. Listen, the absolute trash bags at that league to go after Erica, who has been nothing but supportive of that league, helped that league, tried to want to buy a team, to have these losers in the media. And and it all came out after, right? Like the girl who had a problem with our Bruins towels Mm -hmm. and made that into a controversy. Same, Same small group of people. And then we caught her blatantly lying. Blatantly... And it'll be used against me, saying that I made fun of Denna Lang, who got paralyzed in the Women's Winter Classic, when we did the reverse and actually raised money for her, and I was one of the leaders in that charge. We had a documentary made about it, and we were very close with her. She just published, this girl who hates us, an article in Vice Magazine, blatant lies. And it's just... It, it is the world that I've lived in and now we've lived in where people just get away with lies out of context stuff. And th- this league was the perfect example. It's a story where we really just got attacked. And when we defended ourselves, we're the bad guys, despite them lying, cheating, stealing. There was a girl in that league, African-American player, who tweeted out that we were white supremacists. I mean, you can't get away with that. You shouldn't be allowed to. And I want to rant. I'm like, she should be in jail. And and to say that, that Barcel Sports is white supremacist is outrageous. Where are you, what, what are you going to say to back that up? Again, the Ja Rule thing, that's what, is that your evidence? What, in what, we have a million things to say I mean, it's just crazy to even be discussing it. But, so I did that rant because I'm mad. They, they made up the thing that said I uh, made fun of a paralyzed hockey player. Total lie. Then they deleted it. They, they're like, oh, we support this reporter. Delete it because of the lie. And, and I think that tweet that you put into the world that's now being quoted, and she's being called a hero for calling us white supremacists, is garbage. But go Google Barstool Sports in this league. There's an article. The headline says, basically... And I'll get it exactly right. It's all the same writers. I'm waiting for the internet to work here, but it paraphrased. It's like an article. It's like Dave Portnoy attacks black hockey player. Yeah, I just Googled it and all the headlines from pretty much the first page of Google is about that. So. Is, there, is there an ins- like Scroll down. Put in insider in the in bar and put in insider. That's the one that I saw. There, that headline, that top one. Bar, it, 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 it has a picture of me next to the African American uh, hockey player, and the headline is Barcelona is feuding with NWHL after Dave Portnoy said one of its black players should be in jail for calling a site an openly racist pl- platform. She called us white supremacists. And it, 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 that the way that reads, like, it, it makes it seem like I have an issue with her because she's black, which is crazy. I have an issue with her. I don't care what color you are. You can't say we're white supremacists when there's not one ounce of evidence to support that. That is slander. So, yeah, fuck them. We may do our own league. If really? Erica wants to follow through on it, I'll have her back. So, actually, a barstool hockey league? I have or? zero interest in it, but I'll do it to fuck these people. Any word from from Denna or anything like that? I haven't heard from her. No. I haven't talked to her in forever. And yeah. by the way, I would never put her in the middle yeah. of this. Uh-huh. I know. Did Vice retract that? I don't even know no. that they did. 
It's and crazy. we have the video. I mean, it's like how black and white. And this girl is a liar, cheater, stealer. Not the hockey player, the reporter. We just caught her fucking lying. How do you not fire this person? Yeah, it's, I mean, I still remember that fundraise. Like I said, I, I, I took a picture of my shirt. I was like, I guess this just didn't happen. No, it, it happened her way when she just fucking makes all this shit up. It's crazy. You couldn't have a more black and white example of somebody lying to, to self fulfill their own lies. Yeah. And, and it just sucks because even I know all the, a lot of the players, most of them love Erica, but they're put in a spot. They're not sure whether they can talk out. It's like the Bruins towel thing. If you just let a small group of losers like this girl, Maria and Jemmy get away with it. Like the Bruins should have told her to go shove it. When she caused that controversy with the towels, be like, shut up, get out of here. Instead, people act like they they, they should let. You can't listen to people like that. Just got an axe to grind. Got an axe to grind. Uh, on a much lighter note, surviving bar stool. Love it. I can't believe how good the production is. <laughs> how about last episode? You you nailed it about the first person to be voted off. White Sox Dave. Yeah. <laughs> White Sox Dave. <laughs> Any surprises? Anything uh, about it that you kind of wanted to say? No, it's very good. It's, it's produced. It's produced. One of the best produced things I've ever seen us do. Is this something that could turn into like the next rough and rowdy for us, where it's like a look forward to event and this is, keeps recurring? And the only thing I could think about it bigger is if the prize is like a hundred grand. Yeah. Like 10 grand is nice, but imagine if they were doing it for like life changing mm-hmm. money, it, then it would get, I think, a lot more cutthroat. Would you do it for 100? Yeah. No. 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 But what about just to do it for content? I really don't like the idea of sleeping in that office for seven no. days. No. Well, I, hypothetically, though, if it does get bigger, more sponsors hop on and there's a bigger prize, you could send these people somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's very well done. Yeah. No, it's awesome. It's, it's been great so far. So we'll see how the rest of it goes. Speaking of rough and rowdy, it's Friday. You get pumped up for Conseco. What do you think? What's, are, are you are you worried I, he doesn't show? Are you, do you think no, he's going to come? No, I think he's going to show at this point. Okay. Um, I think he's going to show. I'm excited for it. I have no idea what's going to happen. I, I, I actually think um, – I think uh, Billy Football is going to win. I think he's so much younger. Really? Obviously, Jose is Jose, and he's big and he's scary. But I just, I mean, Billy Football is a good athlete. So I, my money's on Billy Football. Is it true he's not training? Did you hear anything about that? I didn't hear anything about that. No? I, I've I, been so in my world, like, it, it's so busy with everything. I haven't paid that much attention. I know what's happening. I'm excited. You're going to be there? Yeah, I'll be there. So my schedule is I'm back in Detroit because for – all the people tonight at seven were stream. I Casino just launched on the Barcel Sports app in Detroit. It'll be coming Pennsylvania in Michigan. It's fucking awesome. You can play blackjack. I've been. Have you played it? Yeah, it's fucking I have. awesome. Yeah, it's 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 fun. It's awesome. So we'll live stream that. We're launching that this week. Then Friday, go to West Virginia. Saturday to Tampa for a Super Bowl party. Then Sunday back to uh, here for the Super Bowl. That's a fucking weekend. Yeah. Are you excited for the uh, 11 party? I am, but it's, like, I'm running around so much, but I am excited. Yeah, fuck, man. That's a weekend. It's so, it's just tying the whole surviving Barstool into it. The week is just, it, it's great for Barstool that we can not go, we could go from, you know, media week and everything. Usually this week, there's yeah. a ton of big guests on Sirius. First week without Sirius, and all this is jam packed. So it's fucking. Yeah, I mean, Sirius, I haven't spot. been on in so long that I haven't felt like losing it at all. Yeah. So. I don't know what the – there haven't been like a, a deluge of tweets, which is probably good for them. Do you have a, uh, a Super Bowl pick? What do you – What do you, are you excited to get down there? Like what's your – I think the Chiefs, but I haven't – it's not official. I, I – you know, you can never doubt Brady, but he's – you know, he, he has lost some Super Bowls. I just think the Chiefs' offense is unstoppable. Yeah, they're fucking good. It's going to be tough to beat them for sure. But I, Brady's fucking Brady. Best so of all time. We'll see. Uh, speaking of picks, obviously, after we wrapped up last week, uh, there was a little issue with with uh, Rico Bosco going on a different pick show. Um, I was I was told to throw this on the sheet, so Rico, don't crucify me, but it was it was a thing. Yeah, I mean it's disappointing. He knows the rules. You want direct competitors 
radio show. Because, you know, you spell Rico R-I-C-O, and he's the number one I guy. He's going to say whatever he wants. Rico is about Rico first and everybody else second. No I, doubt. So, I don't I mean, know if that's he's true. He's going to act like, oh, I didn't know. He knows. You think? I don't know if that's he true. He knew. He knew. He knew. He but knew. but he's all about he's he's a gift giving guy and he what do you yeah mean he's, but he's like you often ask is there such a thing as an altruistic act I I'd, I'd say no because you do an act to make yourself feel good look good and then by nature that's not altruistic everything Rico does is to make Rico look good and feel good and Rico can brag about what a great guy he is ah uh, I don't know some things are bigger than sports I so like I Rico but that's the fact I disagree. But you guys are okay though. You guys are back. Yeah, on. I had to, I had to do some behind the scenes ball washing to save his, save his spot here. So there were some real issues, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh no, oh no. And then the big story from the weekend was: Did you see Nate and Dante going at it over the weekend about the blog? Vaguely. Vaguely. Okay, we have the, we have the video here that Jack's gonna pull up. Um, so Dante apparently said that. His, he's getting his blog spiked. He's getting, you know. Not the first I've heard about that. Let me nip this uh, Dante bullshit in the bud real quick. From day one, Dante has been the most problematic blogger on the site. First of all, I don't even know if he works at Barstool officially, but he's a good contributor. For sure, a good contributor. But he refuses to follow the rules on everything. We have rules about pictures. He breaks them every day. We have rules about what sort of things we can blog. Politics. He does it every day. And then he goes, why aren't my blogs going up? And we go, Dante, you're using illegal pictures. Dante, we don't write about politics. It's every single day with him. Every day. I have called him on the phone. He has my phone number. I have his. I've called him on the phone multiple times. He doesn't pick up. I've emailed him at all hours of the night. All hours explaining, you have to change this. You can't use an illegal picture here. Sorry, this is too politically charged. We can't post it. I go out of my way to help Dante at every given moment. Hubs and Coley too. It's all three of us. First of all, him coming at me on Twitter. The most coward move I have ever seen. Because he dodges my text. He dodges my phone calls. Nonstop. I reach out to him more than anybody to try to help him on the blog because he's passionate about it and he tries hard and I realize that and he puts in effort, but he needs his hand held every single day. This is not exaggeration. Everybody will back me up on this. Everybody, meaning Coley and Hubs, they will back me up on this. And I go out of my way to help Dante to try to get his stuff up. A lot of it, more him more than anybody, can't go up because he breaks rules or he doesn't follow the rules put in by Dave every single day. I understand his frustration, but to come at me on Twitter when I've done nothing but try to help him is the most cowardly bullshit when he doesn't pick up my phone calls, when I call him to help him. He dodges my phone calls, and now he's crying on Twitter. Why don't my blogs go up? It, it is the most irrational, out-of-place, crybaby bullshit I have ever, ever seen. All right, so that was Nate in response to Dante's tweet saying that it's convenient that he could write this blog when him and Large are getting blogs spiked. Yes. I think, <clears throat> I think Dante has a point. I noticed that headline somehow after Nate invested in this thing. I believe he got caught up. Uh, I may be wrong. I think he got caught up in the GameStop stuff if I was following him a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think that was like a personal agenda blog that I, I don't think Nate should have written again. That that's one of those blogs that should come from me. So I think if Dante is getting stuff spiked, I could easily see, wait, how do you get to do that? Because I think if Dante wrote that, Nate wouldn't publish it. So I, I get his point there. I don't know if the rest of what Nate said is true or not. But in this instance, I see it because that is a, that is a blog where Nate is speaking for Barstool and he shouldn't be in my mind. But Nate, I think, had an ax to grind. So I... and and. So I see Dante's point. Yeah, and then I see I see Nate's point where, and I know firsthand because we've been 
trying to help Tante learn the ropes. And obviously he knows now and he's fucking a great blogger. But, you know, the picture thing. So I, I, I get that too. But the like, picture thing should be fixed easily. Like, just take it out then. But I, what I'm reading on Dante, just so we're clear, it's cool for you to write and post takedowns like this on a whim because you control the blog. I think Dante's right. I think that's 100% right. But then writers like me and Large and 10 other people not in your circle. I don't on. think if Nate wasn't involved in this GME thing and Dante was and Dante wrote that blog, I don't think it gets published. How have you viewed the takeover as a whole from calling Nate Hubs for the blog? Have I've you been, been so fucking busy. I can't, I, I, I'm not sure what the numbers say yet. Yeah. So still kind of waiting to see what goes on. Um, it's kind of a weird spot too, because I don't know, like, w- listen, you got to talk about news regardless if it's good or bad. So with the Steve Cohen stuff, the situation that puts KFC in is kind of is what it is because it's such a big story. You got to cover it. But I think it's past the point where people are covering so many different things. You can't really look out for anything anymore. You know what I'm saying? For instance, like, like people do like the, the Morgan Wallen stuff where people covered that. And, you know, we got a friendly relationship with him, but like someone like, I think it was big T blogged. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. I mean, we don't have the relationship. You, you'd you like to think that I, I mean, on Nate, that was a personal agenda blog Nate wrote. There's no doubt about it. And if you want to write that, the headlines catchy, the headlines poppy. I'm talking about it. I had some people who thought I wrote that headline and the wor- words are different than talking. Yeah. Words last longer. Like oh, yeah. that headline lasts. Nate should not have written that as he wrote it. All right. Fair enough. So then there's the, that's kind so of, so Dante the, has a valid point. Again, Nate's points may be correct, but Nate, that was a personal agenda blog that Nate wrote because he has the power to write it. So are you mad at Nate for doing that? Or is it just kind of like whatever? What, what? He shouldn't have done it. I don't, I won't say mad, but he shouldn't have. He absolutely should not have written that the way that was written. And then I, I know a lot of people probably hopped on here today, fixing that they would get the, uh, the YP sit down. I, I haven't heard from him. Have you heard anything nope. from him? No, so I don't know. Is he still going to the office? I don't know. I I, I don't know. Jack, do you know it by chance? Or I, I don't know if it's if he's still going in or not, but I don't know if you thought we would reach out or whatnot, but uh, maybe we'll get that sit down in the future, maybe not. But uh, needless to say, he's not on here. Uh, Jake Gowen donated $100,000 $100, to the Barstool Fund. Through the hats? No, that was – um. I got confused. I think Owen just straight up donated. Oh, wow. I didn't even – did I know that? Was he the first celebrity in a while? I feel like that's kind of slowed down, no? You said David Dobrik. Yeah. I didn't know. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100K. I also saw kind of cool Mantis donated some money. I didn't see that either. Yeah. That was was nice of him. Um, Let's do some listeners. Glad he's still alive. Yeah. doing, uh, Doing great. Uh, let's do some listener emails and we get out of here. But before we do, though, let's talk about books, Dave. Books, you got books over there. This is uh, Valentine's Day coming up. You're going to want to get it on the books right there. That's, okay. Is yeah. that what these are? Mm-hmm. Yep. Books? Some flowers. Love it. Um, this Valentine's Day, celebrate with the books company. B-O- it, it almost reminds me of Books Barbecue, but it's not. Books Company, B-O-U-Q-S Company, handpicked and sourced directly from their farm. Their flowers stay fresh longer. The Book Company is nationwide, offers next as well as same-day delivery. Skip the hassle of the search and finish your Valentine's Day shopping in one click with their quickie book. Uh, hit the one-click roses button at the top of their homepage, and a bouquet of seasonal roses will be added to your cart, ready for checkout. You know you know what you got to do, unlike those Nate blogs. It's got to somehow be like a lone blogger opinion. You know, like when people do opt-eds almost? Yeah. Because the way he does it, it comes like, you. it looks like you're speaking for Barstool. And that's a big problem. That Correct. we got to figure out. Did that just hit you mid-ad read? Yes. Okay. Uh, for those who prefer more selection, they have you covered with a variety of beautiful style bouquets, plants, gift bundles with pairings such as chocolate, jewelry, candles. Don't forget... The other women in your life. The curated collection of flowers is also perfect for your mom, your grandma, or your sister. Your experience receiving flowers from the Boog Company. See what I did there? That was a um, anchorman. Fruity and slip? No, it says bullet point. Talk about your experience probably is what Oh, I can talk about my experience. They sent me some and they're awesome. Yeah. They sent me some. They're real legit. Nice packaging. And uh, yeah, it's the best way to go. This is, listen, you're not going to want to seek out 
ways to do this, but you know you're going to get flowers for your girl or whatever for Valentine's Day. So why not use Books? Visit Books, B-O-U-Q-S dot com slash Dave. Use code Dave for 20, 25% off. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com slash Dave. So, I mean, it's it, it's a no-brainer. These ads are always the best because you could jump into something that you know you're going to do anyway. So Correct. Go get go get the Books. 100%. Um, you're all right. You feel I feel like you're you, you, you zoned out. No. No, you're good. good. All right. Uh, listener emails, Dave Portnoy Show at BarstoolSports.com. Make sure you send them there. Uh, I get like a million e- a million messages and everything. Ask me what the email is. Like literally, I, I say it every week most of the time. So just use that. Uh, this one's from Nate. What are your thoughts on Josh Richards doing a segment on WFAN with Carton Roberts? So uh, they asked for approval. So, oh, really? Yeah. I was like, yeah. I, for, I, I said two things. I'm like, yes. A, yes. B, I don't think it's my spot to be like, you can't do it. Yeah. Well, so that's more like a courtesy thing, I assume. Uh, yeah, I guess. I Who does he do it? Carton and Roberts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And someone's way, like, well, isn't that what Dave's for? Like, that's what the email said. Like, why is he, you know? I mean, he's just trying to spread his brand. I'm yeah. more surprised. I guess it's them, a nod to me in a way. WFAN? Like Boomer and or Carton and whatever. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's no chance they know who he is without me. No, probably not. I mean, I didn't. Probably not. Most, most, probably most. Well, correction. In the article I read, Carton's kids are big fans of him. So. <sighs> Get out of here. That You mean they didn't. Wait a minute. What? They Carl, didn't say me? They said your name, too. Oh. You were in there, too. You I thought you were like, he found him through the kids. No, no, no. Your article was on there, too. Your, your name was on the article, too, I should say. No, it was. Uh, I mean, Yeah. What do you, I mean, what can you say? You're not going to shoot that I down. I could care less. That's also, I forgot to say this during the Cohen shit. Josh was just hanging out with him like a couple weeks ago. Did they say anything to you about that? No. No? Did You, you knew that though, right? I, now that you mention it, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. It just kind of hit me. They had like dinner at his place and like watched the playoff games there or something. So so obviously, so so no, no, no real thoughts, no issues. He's just spreading his brand. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, he's not an employee here. Yeah, but I so yeah he's not. What's his deal? Is he just we just kinda, have a we just do a podcast. Like no, nope. it's a fifty fifty like deal. Oh, okay, because that's where I and we talked last week about how like chicklets and busting with the boys. Is no, he, so we don't like pay. Okay, we, we okay. split like ad rev. He's just like a re- revenue guy. Okay, um, this one's from Paul. Are you planning? I know you already did a couple, but are you planning on visiting some of these places from the Barstool Fund? I'd like to when I settle down. I've been just so fucking busy, but yeah, when I have time, I'd like to do maybe like a documentary, go view them after or something like that. A lot of people have suggested that. I think it'd be cool. Any ones like at the top of the list? Whenever I come back from Miami, my brain's scrambled, but I mean, there's so many cool ones. Um, You know, people always ask me, there's so many, so many great stories and we've done over 200 of them now. It's almost hard for me to, to single them out. Yeah, 200 is a lot to kind of go back to. Um, this one's from Jared. Who is Deke Zucker? I mean, Deke Zucker is the guy who you I, – I don't know what he does now, but he used to be the guy who listened to, like, Barstool Radio, and he'd just pull quotes and updates and, like, a tweet about it, like what was said, basically. So he doesn't work for us? No. And you have no idea who no, he is? No, I've met him once. Oh, really? Yeah, I've met him once. Yeah, he's kind of a weird guy, but yeah, I've met him once. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that that yeah, was Yeah, no, like, I've met him once. I thought he was just a man of mystery. No, I met him once. Because I know, I think he's a Minnesota guy. He openly talks about that, so. What's that? I think he's a Minnesota guy. He openly talks Why about that. Why are we that, wearing so. these right now? It's like. Do we not have to? No, we only oh, okay. need it for there. All right, well, now they're off. Now it feels weird. Yeah, well, now, now like the ears can fi- breathe. Yeah, we got out of a fish you got to let the ears, ears breathe. Yeah, all right, so Deke is, uh, you know who he is, but you don't know who he is. Correct. Okay, you've met him. There's always been conspiracy theories like he's an insider job. But why would you? He all he does is, I mean, I have no problem with him, but he'll take quotes, and then they kind of seem out of context because you don't have the tone of the radio. Yeah, this was from a bunch of people, so I, if a lot of people are asking, might as well get it answered. Uh, Sportsbook Canada, I don't know, like they're would that ever happen? They're on the brink of legalization. Yeah, I mean, know. you got to get legal. I we'd like, I think we maybe one day will, but we're still trying to open new states. Yeah. And what's the, I mean, I don't know. Can you, I don't know if you could divulge this or not, but what's the strategy behind 
state by state versus kind of just, hey. Each state has different technology. So you got to build the app. Like you can't just be like, okay, we have the app, turn it on in New Jersey. Um, so some, for, you got to be approved to open it in the state like we are Jersey, but we can't just add it because every state has their own laws, regulations. So there is a decent amount of back end work that has to go into it. So we're trying to make sure we're ready to go in states that launch new that were approved and things like that rather than, you know, let's just go spend time building Jersey and game because Jersey doesn't matter when we launch using them as a state. It's already a well established state with a ton of competitors. And when we enter, we'll get the same amount of market share. We'll get whether we enter tomorrow or in six months. Fair enough. All right. So maybe we're just working on the U S right now though. Uh, last one's from Jake. Which employee is most different on camera versus off camera? I really don't have, I feel like everyone's kind of the same at this point. Is there any that jump out for you? Not really, to be honest with you. I think it's kind of... I'm going through the bloggers page right now. I mean, see. weirdly, it could be Tank. I think <laughs> Tank's like fairly normal off camera now. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it last episode, and we had him on the podcast too, and he was a lot, you know, he was pretty restricted. But then when he's on, he's doing his Mets rants, and he's... Yeah clapping his hands and everything like it's it's yeah uh i mean rico's a lot calmer off off camera oh i don't agree i think he's always kind of the same you think so yeah (laughs) i guess so i guess so uh but no i don't have anyone that jumps off for me personally either to be honest with you everyone everyone kind of it kind of blurs right nick's kind of different Nick's a lot more normal than I think people realize, but I know you probably haven't had extensive conversations with him. I mean, I have, but they're, they're, I haven't noticed anything different. How about Kirk? No, Kirk, Kirk's the same. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, that's it. Anything else? How was Miami? What's the... Uh, what's, what's uh, the went out to dinner with J-Lo and A-Rod. Um, that was crazy. Casual. Crazy. It's <laughs> just like... Uh, like a when private I, dinner? Or like, yeah. So it was you, J-Lo, A-Rod. It was me, J-Lo, A-Rod, and their two kids. <laughs> I got a call on Saturday night. It's like, hey, uh, J-Lo and A-Rod want to go to dinner with you tonight. Are you free? I was like, yeah. <laughs> How was that? Surreal. Yeah? I mean, it's fucking J-Lo. I mean, A-Rod I, I've talked with before because he obviously does the corp. But I haven't talked a ton with him. Dan knows him way better than I do, and Erica does. So it was the first time I really sat down with him. But, I mean, J-Lo was, I was, like, nervous. What, if anything at all, what can you give us from that dinner? Occasionally songs would come on, and J-Lo would, like, dance and sing, and I didn't know what to do. (laughs) So what would you do? Just kind of shake, like... (laughs) Bob as much as I could. The little fucking snake squirm. It's like, what do you do? It's a fucking J Lo. I was like, was her voice just great? Yeah, the whole thing was surreal. I mean, she's it. It's just surreal. Like, who go? Who, like, I mean, I. It's one of those. It was definitely one of those moments. Like, where the fuck am I? What happened to my life? Like, oh. I could see you're still kind of like. I went to dinner with A Rod and J Lo. <laughs> You're still kind of thinking about it. You're still kind of uh, what? How long ago was this? Was it like Wednesday or Thursday? Saturday. Saturday. Night. Saturday? All right, so we're a couple days out right now. And yeah. You're still like wow. Like I, you were probably thinking about that. In the they were back. so like deferential in a way. Like he was very complimentary to me. Like she was. I guess I think A Rod's at one point. She's like, yeah, you know, Jennifer didn't really know what who you were, but then she saw you in the news talking about this GameStop stuff, and I, they obviously don't like Steve Cohen because he got the message. It's like Jennifer's like, oh, I like this guy. I don't know. It's just surreal. <laughs> it's just so, fucking surreal. Do you think you'll be invited back to another dinner? I really don't know. I I, I don't know. I I. Would have said I'd never get invited to one dinner with J Lo and A Rod, but I had dinner with J Lo and A Rod. What would you order? Is there like a? Are you thinking about that when you go? Like, is that? I just tried to follow like whatever was happening, you know. (laughs) Okay. And I showed up before them, and I and I was like, yeah, I think we have a reservation for A Rod. 
<laughs> and they're like we don't we don't have one for a rod I'm like oh all right that's like a prank and i'm i'm just sitting there I'm like this is interesting and the place was busy and it's like uh <laughs> But, you know, it was a private room, and then they just show up. Everything's ready. They just usher them in to the back room. And, and you were already sitting there? No, I was waiting for them. Oh, like, okay, okay. Wow. Dinner with A-Rod and J-Lo. Yeah. Well? Now I'm sitting here with you, Eddie, doing a podcast. Yeah, talking, talking. I don't know, talking about everything. Shit. I didn't mean the state was that movie, by the way. What? Enemy, Enemy, of, the Enemy of the State. state yeah. That's what that guy feels like. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Gene Hackman's like sitting in like an uh, unmarked house basically where he has like no technology so no one can trace him and he's trying to bring down the establishment. I mean, that's what that guy reminded me of. Yeah, that guy. I mean, he, you got to have no fear to do what he's doing. Yeah. Holy fuck. I don't know why. For some reason, Gene Hackman and Tommy Lee Jones crossed in my brain. I was like, it's not Men in Black, but. I mean, Men in Black was an alien I know, movie, Eddie. I, I know, but like, I don't know. I, maybe, dude, fucking uh, comparisons could draw from anything, dude. What do you like? It's not. How could it be? How could he be in? I an don't alien know. Movie? I thought you were gonna do like the fucking Men in Black was literally an alien, movie. like the memory stopper. You know? No, enemy of the state. All right, Dave. Anything else? No, just very busy. Uh, if you're in Michigan, you can do the. Um, iGaming now casino blackjack online and we will be announcing very shortly our super bowl plans uh overs club will be back for the super bowl the jackets are so fucking ugly they may be unbelievable like what welker created we want gold jackets Woo! wait till you see these they are i sent them to dan i'm like first i said brace yourself he's like what oh no i'm like wait till you see these jackets and i and i'm sent him like they may be so hideous that they actually work <laughs> and before i could press it he's like these are so bad that they're good i mean are they like mustard or something let me see if i can no they're not mustard because a lot, a lot of people fuck up gold oh wow <laughs> I mean, wow those jackets are like surreal exactly <laughs> It's like uh, the inside of a Wonka wrapper. Unbelievable you know, jackets. That's <laughs> yeah, look out for those, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right, then. That's it. We'll be back next week. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you then. All right.